Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are coming to you with your Golden Globes 2021 red carpet review. Honestly, for the first big red carpet of the year, it wasn't a bad outing. There were a lot of looks to be turned. I think a lot of designers that were used to seeing provide hot mess dresses on the red carpet actually picked it up. I think the year off sort of gave them a lot of time to think. There wasn't that much bad stuff. So you know what? I'm not super duper mad about it. And I'm going to stop saying you know what at this point now officially. So let's get into this review. So first up is Amanda Seafried. Seyfried? Amanda, I still don't know how to say it. But she is wearing this pink Oscar de la Renta gown. It is a simple sort of cut. It's only shown from the back, which for me is a little bit upsetting because like I'd like to see what it looks like in the front. That's important. And I really don't like the way that everybody willy nillies their little digital red carpet moments. It just, it's not distinct. We're not all on the same playing field. It's upsetting me. But honestly, it's not bad for what it is. It's a simple sort of pink gown. Evidently, it's very backless. There's a whole lot of back going on. Some sort of wrap or shawl of fabric flowers in this also quite gorgeous pink comes out and sort of wraps itself around Amanda as well. Honestly, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I would like to have seen it from the front because I think that actually allows you to see what the dress looks like, but for the purposes of this shot, I think it's actually really beautiful. I think the fabric flowers sort of effortlessly accentuate the rest of the dress and the dress is so simply cut, which is sort of classic of an American designer like Oscar de la Renta, that it doesn't take attention away from the flowers and the flowers sort of become the most important aspect of this dress. And I think that's okay in this moment. I think that's fine. I think that's wonderful. I think she looks really, really good. I'm fine with this. Next up is Andre Day and she is wearing Chanel Haute Couture. Now this is from the spring summer 2021 Haute Couture collection that Virginie Viard just showed. If you want to see our review of that collection, it's here, it's happening. But I love this dress. This was one of my favorite dresses on that actual runway. And I think Andre Day pulled it off stunningly. It's not really a hard dress to pull off, but I think she did it really, really well. Normally I'm not big on like the whole tulle skirt thing, just sort of jutting out from an interesting bodice. But like in this moment, I will take it because something about this bodice is fully sheer and yet at the same time is interesting because it utilizes braiding to create these really interesting motifs. There's sort of like hexagons that go from large to small and large to small and large to small. And in that regard, Virginie Viard claps for you. I also think it's smart that the way that the tool is actually brought into the torso as well is also quite nice. It doesn't just let it go from braided top into tool skirt. There's sort of this draping of this tool that pulls the skirt and the torso together in a way that actually looks kind of nice. It allows them to sort of coexist in a weird way. But the fact that the tool is sheer also allows the sheer effect of this braided top to still play out quite well. Honestly, I think she looks really, really lovely. I think the color is gorgeous. I think overall it's a really smart look. And listen, there were a couple duds from that Chanel collection to choose from. Andre Day's stylist chose a great one. And like, honestly, at this point in my experience watching Virginie Viard Chanel on the red carpet, it seems like it's very rare you get a good moment. So when you do, you take it happily. Next up is Angela Bassett. And like, I want her to win, but you're wearing Dolce & Gabbana. And so you can't win. There's no winning. Even if it looks good, it doesn't look good because it's Dolce & Gabbana. You know what I mean? It just, it doesn't work out that way. It's a simple sort of purple gown. There's some gathering at the bust and then an asymmetrical feather floof, I will call it, sort of pulls out from one breasticle, comes around the back, and then sort of pulls itself into a high slit. And like, you know what? It's a nice color. I do like the fact that the feathers sort of go all throughout, but why are we choosing Dolce & Gabbana? We all know, we've read the articles, we've seen the YouTube videos, we've watched the Instagram stories. What is with the Dolce & Gabbana? Is it we're getting paid to wear Dolce & Gabbana on the red carpet? Cause like, guys, come on, this is ridiculous. Any stylist that is pulling Dolce & Gabbana, you know what you're doing. It's not cute. It's not good. We don't like it. We don't stand. We are not a fan of it. So no. And also like, if you need to know what happened with Dolce & Gabbana, cause you're not caught up, we have a video about that as well. So like, go watch that. And then you'll understand what's going on with Dolce. But Angela Bassett, I expect better. I want better. I feel like I need and deserve better. Cause you're an icon, a star. You deserve 
so much more. Oh, okay, good moment. Good moment coming up, and it's from Dior. So next up is Anya Taylor-Joy, and she is wearing a Christian Dior Haute Couture custom creation, which I mean, technically all couture should technically be custom creations. Essentially, she's wearing this green, very beautifully cut, sort of simple slinky dress. It, it fits her gorgeously. And over top is this gorgeous green cape. Maria Grazia, hats off to you, woman. You're killing it here. This is a great moment. Slowly but surely, I am becoming indoctrinated into the Maria Grazia Curie Dior-ness. And I don't know how it's happening. I feel like it might be COVID. I don't know. Maybe I got COVID and then I lost my taste buds and like now this is where I'm at in my life. But I love this. As I mentioned, I think the dress fits her beautifully. She's stunning, she's gorgeous, it's wonderful. Is it a little bit too long? Possibly, possibly. But again, I'm not like a hemline expert, so I'm I'm not sure. It looks a little bit long to me because like I'm only seeing a little bit of ankle. I'm only seeing like half of an ankle and I feel like that's a weird point. But I think this cape perfectly pulls together what would have normally been just a really boring but beautifully cut dress. Here's the thing about the cape. Maria Grazia likes a big old sort of wrap. She likes to add sort of layering. It's sort of like this Mediterranean sort of like old world Romany sort of feel, a little bit like North African sort of thrown in there as well. And honestly here I think it's really beautiful. I think it's stunning. I think it adds such a character, such a silhouette, such just an ounce of oomph that makes it much more depthful. It has a lot more depth from it. I think that the cut of it is really, really stunning. I think the fact that it's in the exact same green as the actual dress is wonderful. I couldn't ask for more, because if we did something crazy over the top, jacquard embroidered, you know, tarot, crazy mythical references and motifs, it just would have been too much. I think the fact that she kept it really simple, really clean, I'm very proud. And I think the shoe matches perfectly with it. I think it's great. Overall, I think this is a great example of doing simple, really, really well. It doesn't have some crazy bells and whistles. It doesn't have some ridiculous asymmetrical drape and strap and gather and pull and pleat. It's just a simple, nice jacket with a simple, nice dress and a simple, nice shoe. It's all brought together. It's, it's beautiful. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. It's like a beautiful basil plant growing out with a nice little blonde moment going on as well. I'm happy about this proud La Roach, Anya Taylor-Joy, Maria Grazia. Hats off to you. You did it, people. Next up is Celeste. Now, Celeste is a British singer and she was nominated, I believe. I have not listened to her music, but I've heard from some great stylist that she is one to watch. So I'm happy that we're getting to watch her be the one. So she's wearing Gucci. I don't love it. I'll be honest. I have seen seen Celeste's Instagram and I have seen some like crazy moments going on and I do wish that we had gotten maybe a little bit more indie sort of fashion brand because I feel like she really can pull it off. But let's get into this Gucci dress. Now it's some sort of black velvet top which already is putting me off because it's just a little bit simple. And then we get into like a black satin waistband which that's how you know you're going downhill. That's the moment you say to yourself, oh no what's happening. I will say, I think the skirt is perfectly Gucci. I think the fact that it's these sort of vibrant colors of blue and red and green and, you know, black, all playing in in these stripes that then at a certain point sort of like chevron, they zigzag, and then there's the sort of mishmash of colors and creations and lines and blocks and squares and rectangles all sort of coming together. It is like Gucci-ish, like I, I, you know, when you say it's Gucci, I say, okay, I see it, but I don't think that it's a spectacular dress and I feel like I've seen better Gucci looks. I feel like Alessandra Michele has really pivoted away from just doing like the old lady granny chic style. And I feel like he's brought some sort of different themed aspects to his collections recently that make it a little bit more interesting. And I feel like this is just sort of going back to that old shtick. And listen, the old shtick worked great. It was wonderful when it was wonderful, but at a certain point, you can't keep repeating yourself because eventually people are gonna stop buying the same thing because they already own it. 
You know what I mean? In that regard, I think that Alessandro, also in the red carpet district, needs to pivot away from that sort of style to make it a little bit more enticing, a little bit more exciting, a little bit more interesting. I will say, I think the fact that you have these sort of satin green gloves that match stripes in the skirt is nice. I think it's fine. But overall, it's not the most exciting look. It's not really wonderful. And the only reason that you can't really call it ugly is because it's Gucci and so that's it's sort of supposed to be ugly and it defeats the purpose of calling it ugly because you already know that it's meant to be ugly. So if you call it ugly, you're just complimenting it because that's what it wants to be. That's how I feel about so many of these designers at this point. Like they're putting out something and they have the intention and it might not be the intention I want, but it's the intention I'm going to get because that's what they do. Okay. One of the greatest moments of tonight was Cynthia Erivo arriving in Valentino Orcuchor spring, summer 2021. This was one of the most exciting looks from that most recent Valentino Haute Couture collection. Again, if you don't know about that collection, watch the video. It's very good. It's very in detail. Pier Paolo Piccioli really like did it. He did it. That was that collection. He did it. And I think this dress is honestly so exciting. It's one of those bursts of color that Pier Paolo put in this collection that sort of is this hearkening back to Valentino pre-COVID. And I think a great thing about Pier Paolo is he's really sort of put a mirror to what is happening in our world now in his collections. And so you went from crazy bright over the top for seasons and seasons and seasons, COVID hit all white, which like, that's not a Valentino thing. And then the most recent season, we've sort of trickled back in these colors that are being sort of suppressed by white at the beginning of the collection. But as we get towards the end, it's vibrant, it's bright, it's in your face, it's over the top. And so to me, it's a little commentary on like the world that we're living in. And I think that the Cynthia Revo dress is really, really interesting because I think it's also a sort of take on like the backstage aspect, the looking inside of what the atelier of a couture house like Valentino sort of does. So you're seeing this sort of bouffant ball gown silhouette. It's really beautifully done. And it sort of has these weird princess seams, but they're not really seams. There's some sort of like, I want to call it like a structure. It's like what Buddy from the Cake Boss uses to like keep the cakes in place. It's like a pipe in its own way. But at the same time, the pipe sort of takes on this princess cut dress feel where it sort of shapes the dress. So it cuts it right down the middle. And then from the sides, you can sort of see it create a torso and create this sort of elongated ball gown, sort of big old shape. The other thing about the dress is you can actually see in the fabric, if you zoom on in, there are little like stitches in a sort of darker green that when you look really closely, it almost looks like the chalk sort of prints that you would see when people are pattern cutting for gowns like these, or even sort of the back ends of stitches when somebody is stitching and it's visible in a garment or in a piece of fabric or in a textile. So in that way, to me, this is a whole sort of commentary on the backstage aspect of what goes into making haute couture and garments of these types and styles and Valentino, even in ready to wear, even in like the secondary lines, it seems like a lot of handiwork, a lot of time, a lot of effort goes into creating those clothes. So in that regard, I think it's a beautiful reflection of the brand that you'd have to have like a little bit of a backstory about Valentino to understand. But I think just the fact that this is a neon green ball gown dress with like crazy piping that shapes the whole look just allows it to also be something that's very exciting for everybody who doesn't know too much about Valentino. To be honest, I didn't think we were gonna be seeing a Valentino spring, summer 2021 look like this on the red carpet, but like, I'm happy that Cynthia Erivo and her team just went for it. Like, it's beautiful. I think she pulls it off beautifully. I think it looks stunning on her. I even think the gloves are good. I think that they add in some sort of, you know, that whiteness of that collection from fall 2020. That is the sort of suppression. But here again, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The green look takes over. It is a thing that you were looking at and the whiteness, the sort of starkness, the sort of clean slate of COVID in my opinion, is sort of much more subtle here because we can see the fact that, you know, vaccines are coming and people are becoming, people are developing antibodies. And like, I'm not trying to do a whole political commentary here because that's not what I'm trying to do. But what I'm trying to say is I think that these pieces are very allegorical. And if you look at it from that perspective, you're like, oh shit, this is fire. So honestly, Cynthia Revo, 
Killed it. Very proud. Very happy. Great job to everybody involved here. Look at me being so positive. I'm so nice today. This is what happens when people do their job. This is what happens when everybody turns out a look. It's very enjoyable for everybody involved. Next up is Dan Levy and he is also wearing Valentino Haute Couture. Haute Couture for menswear is actually becoming a popular sort of thing. I feel like maybe I could do a video about it, but I'm, listen, I'm probably not. So like, let's not get our hopes up there. So this sort of chartreuse suit it's nice. I think it's interesting. I like that Dan Levy always takes a bit of a risk. And then there's this sort of sequined top underneath. It's in like a gold. And then you have some sort of simple turtleneck under that as well that sort of ties back into the chartreuse suit. I will say the silver shoe, maybe we should have gone for a gold shoe to match the sequins of the shirt underneath. That's my one issue here is that go gold. Listen, why are we mixing gold and silver? I don't understand that. I'm a silver girl. I know people that are gold girls or gold guys or gold whoever's. And in that regard, stick to the same metals. It's much chicer. So in that regard, don't love the shoe choice. They're also a little bit chunky for me. They're a little bit too platform. It's a little bit too 1970s. But overall, I like that Dan Levy took a risk. I think that the look the clothing, the garments look very, very nice. My issue is the accessorization. Next up is Isa Gonzalez, and she is wearing Versace. Listen, for Versace, it's a very simple look. I feel like Donatella in recent collections has really gone like bold, over the top, maximal sort of vibe. But to me, this is also a little bit referential of like her early 2010s sort of collections that were a lot more sporty and like not minimal, cause like Versace can't be minimal. It's like not in the brand DNA but it's just a little bit more pared down. I think it fits her really, really lovely. I think that you have these little white sort of pipings that create a breast sort of shape here. They're interesting enough. And the fact that you have the little white piping at the collar too. Overall, it's a very simple dress. And I think the only thing that really like salvages it from being too simple is those little white sort of piping details at the breast. I expect more. I thought that last Versace collection, I haven't seen the one that's coming out yet at this point, but that last one, like under the sea, Little Mermaid, it was fun. It was exciting. Like, why couldn't we get a custom moment for that? You know what I mean? It's over the top, ridiculous, crazy, kooky. That's what I want from Versace. Like I want ugh, too much. I want gauche. I want gaudy. I want tacky. I want all of it drenched in that Italian goodness. And this to me, a little bit too safe. Next up is Elle Fanning and she's wearing Gucci. And I hate this. I'm so sorry. I know people are gonna be like, how can you hate this? She looks stunning. I don't think it's a good bias cut dress. Like I just, I really genuinely don't. So if you don't know, a bias cut dress is essentially when fabric is cut diagonally and it's sort of meant to really fit and like cling to your body. It was sort of invented by Madeline Viennet. It was really popular with the sort of stars of the silver screen in the 1930s it sort of comes back every once in a while and the thing is i actually don't think in terms of like the bust it's cut wrong i don't think even at the waist it's cut wrong i don't think the skirt is even really cut wrong and i like the fact that it has little flowing flit at the back that l is playing on my issue really comes in with that weird pulled over gathered piece that's like right above the pelvis i don't understand i think it just absolutely ruins the look i can't take my my eyes off of it. It's so strange. I think it's so weird. And I think for Gucci, it's almost like smart for them to just do simple. I don't think that them doing simple, like a really beautifully cut bias gown is a bad thing. I think it's a real expertise to be able to cut a bias cut dress in a way that really accentuates the wearer. And I think the fact that we had to do one little ugly thing just like ruins it. I, I don't think this is the style to do that in. I don't think it works. I don't think it adds anything. I really think it only detracts from the fact that you can't now say Gucci does a beautiful bias cut gown, which to me then sort of puts customers off it or would put customers off it. Cause like, I don't want them to it up my bias cut gown. Cause Lord knows it's probably beautiful silk. It's also probably very expensive probably very time inducive to create this. And then you're just gonna put some shitty gathered pleated fabric over the waist for what reason? What was the reason as Cardi B once iconically said? That's how I feel about this. I feel like it's just ruined by that moment. I want to love this, but Gucci is not allowed that. Next up is Emma Corrin. Now she is wearing Miu Miu and she has become a Miu Miu girl. She was like in the ad campaigns. She's like sort of part of this world of Prada, but it's actually really Miu Miu because they're not the same thing. 
if anybody tries to tell you, they're not the same thing, they're different. But this essentially, from my understanding, according to one Harry Lambert, who is her stylist, it's actually a reference to Pierre Rowe or Pierre Doe the Clown, which was like some sort of clown reference from maybe 19th century. I'm not really sure. I didn't really have enough time to do the research on it, but I like this. I think it's interesting. I think it's fun. I think it's funky. So let's get into it. It's a simple sort of cut black velvet dress from my understanding. It's full of sort of spaced out little crystals, which like, I don't know, maybe that's like a social distancing reference. That could be fun. That could be interesting. I'm going to let them have that one there. And I do think that they add to the gown. I think they make it a little bit more interesting. I don't think that they're placed crazily. I think the fact that they're evenly sort of spaced out, it allows the moment to work well. I'm happy with that. I also think that the way that you have these sort of weird shoulder pads adds an excitement to it. I don't think that they're a normal sort of like 80 shoulder pad. It feels like a little bit more bulbous. It feels a little bit more odd, even in a weird way, which I think is a little bit more exciting. And also like the ruffles, it does sort of add that like old timey clown feeling, which like is really creepy. But like, I think that's what they were going for. And so in that regard, it's like wonderful. Overall, I think a lot of the elements play well together. I think the fact that you have the white of the ruffle, the white tiny little slip of sort of satiny cuff, and the sort of white silvery crystals all play off of each other very, very well. I think the fact that then you have a black dress that has an interesting sort of silhouette where it's quite chunky up here, but the rest of the dress is really beautifully tapered. And you know, it's a sort of slim, nice cut that flares out very, very effortlessly. I'm not obsessed with the slit. I don't really feel like the slit was super duper necessary. We could have just had a little nice cut in the back that would have allowed her to walk and talk and move and groove. I feel like the slit almost tries to like add a sexiness to it that this is not a sexy dress in that way. Like you can't Angelina Jolie like leg out for it. Like that's not what we're going for here. We're going for sex in like an abstract way. It's about show, we're not even going really for sex, I don't think. I think this just showcases the body beautifully. I don't think that this needs to be sexy. I don't think it needed a big old slit that like shows a little tiny bit of thigh. Cause like, no offense, clowns aren't sexy. They're not, I'm sorry, they're not. Like I don't, I've never seen a sexy clown. And like sound off in the comments, I wanna know, have you ever met a sexy clown? I don't think you have. But I do think besides the slit, it's a really nice dress. I think it's really interesting. I think it makes you think I think it's a little bit different. I think it's a little bit out there. I'm happy with this. Next up is Jillian Anderson and she is also wearing Christian Dior Haute Couture. I have an issue with this one. I just, I can't get behind this gown. So this is from the spring 2021 collection, I believe. And listen, I understand Maria Grazia is trying to like do something with these circular sort of bust moments, but like, it's just ugly. It's not cute. It doesn't work. It's not nice. It's not exciting. The fact that you have that like tiny string that creates like a halter effect is gross. The fact that you have that green little circle, it's not even like a green circle that falls into the rest of the wraparound of the fabric. Like it's so weird to then have to see this like gold that meets it. Like why couldn't we have done green? It would have sort of maybe played off of itself better at least somewhat. It would have made it a little bit more conspicuous, but no, we just have to put gold fabric there for what reason? Why? What was the necessary point of that? Also the skirt, it's a sort of very accordion pleat that sort of falls all the way down. It's full of this old timey lace, which I don't think is very, very nice. I don't think it's a nice dress. I don't think it's cohesive. I don't think it has any sort of parts of it that work together well. I think that it's a little hodgepodge of elements. I just don't understand why this was chosen because actually I think from that collection, there were a lot of really, really nice Dior Couture looks like, and again, I might sound a little bit nutty when I'm saying that, but like, I mean that. I think there were actually really nice, beautiful sort of styles. There were like stunning jacquards. And like, I'm talking about fabric and inanimate object as hot and sexy. Like this is not hot and sexy. This is scary. Next up is Jackson Lee and he is wearing Gucci and Honestly, I don't love it. I, I do see the sort of Italianism of like the silks and the sort of like old tiny Medici Florentinian sort of jacket that's like draped over this black suit, but like there's no cohesion between the two. It's like a black suit with a Nike sneaker and like a green and red jacket put over top of it. I don't, I don't, where's the cohesion? What is the storyline we're getting here? What I don't understand. It's not making any sense. It's not really a logical experience. I do think the pants look nice from what I can see. Also, like it blocks the suit. That might be a really nice suit underneath there. I just can't tell because there's a jacket over it 
and the jacket is so distracting. It's not a helpful distraction, it's a harmful distraction. Jackson, Gucci, guys, what are we doing? What's going on here? Next up is Josh O'Connor and he is wearing Loewe. I don't love this, I'll be completely honest, but I don't hate it. And I think that's an interesting dichotomy we should dissect. I do think that the blazer looks nice. I like that it's black. I think it plays off the shoes well. I think it sort of brings in that sort of old school sort of British tailoring, Jonathan Anderson, he's a Brit. That all makes sense. I do think the shirt underneath sort of gives it this Oscar Wilde-y sort of style. And like when I do think of Josh O'Connor, I do sort of think of Oscar Wilde. I started watching that show, The Dirtle Thing, where he's like typing on an old timey type writer in Greece. So like maybe that's where the Oscar Wilde thing is, but he's not gay in that. So like, um, you know, maybe it's not that Oscar Wilde-y. But I do think this sort of necktie that's not really a suit, doesn't really conform to the notions of, you know, having to wear a suit. I like that. I appreciate that. I think that's fun. I think that's exciting. I think that's interesting. I think that it breaks away from the notion of like traditional menswear which I think we need to do more because like traditional menswear is very fucking boring it's the most boring but my issue really comes in with the pants like I don't know a lot about tailoring I'll be completely honest with that but like those don't look good those look a little bit baggy they look a little bit MC hammery I don't like the way that they touch the shoes that makes me uncomfortable I feel like they fall strangely I don't think they do anything for Josh I don't even think they like play into the rest of the outfit well. So that's like upsetting to me. It's sad because the rest of it could have been nice. Have we had like a nice little tailored little cigarette pant? Ooh, it would've been hot, would've been sexy, would've fit well. But this, this doesn't fit well. I don't like that. I don't understand why we've done it, but we need to fix it. Next up is Julia Garner and she is wearing Prada. Now, listen, it's Prada. And so in that regard, like it's gonna be ugly. I know people are gonna be like, Prada's not ugly. Prada's ugly, sorry. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that's what it is. Like they called it the ugly she collection spring summer 1996 for a reason. That's okay. Because sometimes what is perceived as ugly is actually very, very intelligent. And so I think this dress is also very, very intelligent. This dress has this very deep sort of plunging neckline. Now, when you think of Prada, you don't always sort of think of sexy, but Mutra Prada is sexy in a way that's very intelligent. She does utilize a woman's body to showcase sort of the natural figure, the natural form. She's not opposed to that. She just does it in her own way. She almost allows the person that is wearing the sort of Prada piece that is a little bit suggestive to be in control of the suggestion, if that makes sense. And I think that this plunging neckline allows that to happen. I do think the dress doesn't really fit super duper tightly, but again, I don't think Prada is like a always super duper tight fitting sort of style. Also these pleats. Very Prada, very there. It's not a kick pleat, cause like that's what is sort of like the usual Prada sort of pleat, but it is an accordion pleat and Mutual Prada does like an accordion pleat. There are collections that are sort of referential of Elsa Scaparelli and Viennet and sort of goddess cuts. And I think that this sort of has a very Romanistic antiquitian sort of style where it's very loose, it's very form fitting. It's in a sort of natural color of white, although black's not really like an antiquitian color cause it's very hard to get black, you know, from dyes. It's hard to dye things black at that point at least. So in that regard, I do think it brings in the sort of old timey Italian feel. Also, the embroidery at the waist. Now, normally I don't like a waist. I feel like it's has to be accentuated very naturally, but Prada is all about embellishments. The embellishments are very important. Mutra Prada has constantly tried to reinvent embellishments in modern ways. Now, I do think the little black embellished dots that go down the pleats do that very, very well. I don't know if the big band waist does that. I do think that it makes it a little bit old, a little bit, mm, why is it there? So in that regard, I think we've hit a dud there. I think a sort of sleeker with a less intricate sort of motif in this beading at this waist would have been far better. But overall, I think it's very Prada. And in a weird way, I think it's allowed to be very Prada. I do think that it's not the most attractive dress in the entire world, but I don't think that Prada is ever trying to be the most attractive dress in the entire world. So again, it's sort of that reference back to Gucci is calling it like ugly isn't necessarily a insult because in reality, it's almost sort of what it's trying to be. It's sort of trying to move past this notion of what fashion should be. That's Prada. It's not straightforward. It makes you think. And I think this is a dress that it makes you think. Next up is Kaylee Cuoco and she is wearing Oscar de la Renta. Now this is from the fall 2020 collection. It's a pretty dress. Listen, I can't be mad about it. It's a nice fitted ball gown dress. I do think that the embroidery is 
basic, but I at the same time think it's a little bit exciting. I do like the fact that the motif is symmetrical. It, you know, it's, it's social distancing itself from everybody else, which is important. And I do like the fact that it's sort of a sprig and sprite and sort of splash of what looks like fireworks. But the thing about this collection is that collection was actually referencing not only Truman Capote's black and white ball, it was also referencing the sort of Sorcerer's Apprentice because Laura Kim and Fernando Garcia, who are the creative directors of Oscar de la Renta, almost felt that when they were young and working at Oscar de la Renta for years and years and years, they almost felt like the sort of Mickey Mouse in the Sorcerer's Apprentice story to Oscar de la Renta, who is now passed. So in that regard, when you think about it in that way, this embroidery sort of does make a little bit more sense. It almost feels like something that would come out of a wand in a Disney movie. And so like knowing the context of that, I can't be mad about it. I do think the fact that it's a nice sort of light silvery gray dress also works. I think it fits Kaylee very, very well. I think it's a nice dress. I can't be mad about it because I know the backstory of it. And so in that regard, like, it's cute. It's a nice dress. It's a good, it's a good ball gown. Next up is Kate Hudson and she is wearing Louis Vuitton. And now in this regard, I don't hate it. I feel like I'm being so nice, but I, I'm not trying to be nicer than normal. I'm just being nice. I think the fully sort of embroidered bodice is interesting. I do like the fact that it has this off the shoulder sort of silky satiny little sleeve moment going on and then that sort of falls into the bottom of it as well. I do wish that the skirt was also in that fabric. I think that would have tied it together much better than the sort of more matte black skirt. Also the belt. I don't think the belt is necessary. I don't really understand why we needed a belt. Listen, if the bodice fit, well, we would have just not needed a belt to cover it. Also like, again, the belts on the thing, I don't know if, maybe that's like an LVMH thing. I'm not understanding why we all of a sudden need a belt. Is it because the dress doesn't fit? And if that's the case, well, then I'm very upset about that. I do think that the skirt, it's fine. But again, I think that weird sort of side slit is strange. And I feel like we should have had it in that satiny sort of fabric. It would have made a lot more sense. It would have been a lot more exciting. I think it would have tied everything together much stronger. I do actually think it's a good direction for Louis Vuitton. I do think it's like a nice look that if perfected would have actually been a real like, hit her out of the park. It's a little bit odd, it's a little bit strange, but like that's Nicolas Jaskier. It's like, I don't understand what's ever happening, but like this to me seems cohesive enough that I can somewhat pick up what's going on. Next up is Keenan Thompson and he is wearing, again, I don't know at this point, so I apologize, but it's this green suit. Listen, it's a little bit boring menswear, which at this point, again, like we need to step it up a little bit. We need to be a little bit more exciting, but I like the fact that it's not like just a black suit. It's a green suit in that regard. It's interesting. It's a little bit out there. I like the fact that the bow tie matches the silky sort of lapels. The color, it's interesting enough. I feel like, you know, he could have just went for a blue or a red or a black. And the fact that he went for this like interesting sort of, it's not a forest green, but it's like a, pine green to me. And I think that works out well. I do think the shoes, we could have done like a boot. A boot would have been nice, Keenan. Get with the boot. We want the boots. Overall, I want to be a lot madder about it, but it's fine. Next up is Kiersey Clemens, and she is wearing Prabal Gurung. Now this is from Prabal Gurung's Fall 2020 collection. This was the finale look, and I like it. I think it's really, really nice. I thought that was a really strong Prabal Gurung collection. I think that it added a little bit of excitement. It's a little bit sexy. I like the fact that there's this sort of like encrusted sort of crystal on the cutout. I like the fact that it's a nice black velvet and it showcases body. I think, again, this is a dress that's going to be sexy. It wants to be sexy. It wants to showcase the body. And in that regard, I think it does that very, 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 very well. I think it's a nice dress. Listen, I'm sort of even into the asymmetry of it. I think that, I think the fact that you have a one shoulder that's on one side sort of balances out the fact that you're seeing a lot of skin on the other side. I think that overall, it's nothing crazy. It's nothing over the top. It's nothing ridiculous, but I can see a lot of people saying, oh, that's a nice dress. Like I want that. Like that looks good. It's well done. I'm not mad about it. Happy to see it. Next up is Kristen Wiig and she is wearing Prada. Now, remember what we said about Prada earlier? It's kind of meant to be a little bit uggo. It's a little bit out there. It's a little bit strange. In this regard, this is a simple sort of baby doll dress in this very light minty green. It has a silver embellished, you know, neckline and then these 
little bit of a darker green bows that sort of hide the pleating that sort of creates a little bit of a ruffle in the front. To be completely honest, I actually don't mind it. I think, again, this is a little bit out there for Prada. I think it's a little bit strange. I think it's a little bit kooky, but like that's what I want from Prada. I do wish that we'd seen a little bit more referentialness to, you know, Raff and Mucha's sort of first collection. We'll get into that a little bit with Sarah Paulson, but for the most part, I feel like we could have referenced those collections and those sort of styles and those sort of aesthetics that are becoming part of the new Prada a lot more. I think it's a little bit more important to sort of incorporate those styles into the red carpet so that the brand sort of image is cohesive. I think the length of the dress is great. I think that it sort of brings this, I'm gonna say Mucha Prada in the 1960s vibes, which if you know anything about Mucha Prada in the 1960s, she really liked sort of the mod style. She enjoyed a Mary Quant sort of mini skirt. She never owned one, but she did learn how to eventually sew her school uniform skirt so it was kind of shorter and had that sort of mini skirt effect in Italy in the 1960s. And so that's what's going on here in this sort of baby doll cut for me. I feel like the embellishments is her trying to modernize embellishments again. I don't know how heavily involved Raph is in the custom game, I wonder. I think it'd actually be interesting to see what's the vibe there. But I do think the fact that the neckline embellishments match the shoes is smart. I think that plays in well together. I don't think it's a really bad thing. I do think the little sort of darker green bows add just that little like twang of weirdness to the look and sort of put you off just a little bit. And at the same time, it allows these sort of weird ruffles to sort of take place without sort of drawing your eye to where these ruffles are really sort of coming from, like how they're actually been technically made. So in that regard, I can see it. I do wish in a weird way, maybe they'd done the bows with like the embellishments on them. It could have tied everything a little bit more together. But the thing about Prada is like, something gotta be weird. Something gotta be strange. Something gotta be off. For me, as somebody that appreciates the Prada brand and its aesthetics and its history, I really like it. For the everyday person, I can completely understand you typing in the comments saying, this is disgusting. What are you talking about? But I also like that Kristen Wiig always takes a risk. Like she goes for the weird shit because Kristen Wiig is kind of weird. That's what she does. And so in that regard, I respect both Prada and Kristen Wiig for sort of going forward in this moment. Next up is Lana Condor and she is wearing Monique Lulier and it's a sort of simple blue tulle dress with, you know, floral embroidery. Lana Condor to me is this like Netflix sort of everyday sort of girl, sweet, nice. She's sort of part of that like teen romance, rom-com community. And so like this to me makes sense for her brand right now. I do want her to eventually like step out a little bit from that more, I do want her to get a little bit more exciting, but I also feel like a lot of fashion brands are not at the point where they understand that we should dress her. In that regard to the brands, let's get it together. Honestly, I do think that in regards to like the dress, it's fine, you know, it's pretty sort of Forever 21-y, sort of at the same time like Claire's boutique-y. And so like, if that's the brand that she's at at this point, like that's what her aesthetic is, fine. But I'd like an evolution eventually, because that'll get very old very quickly. Next up is Laura Dern and she is wearing Givenchy by Matthew Williams. Not obsessed. I don't think it fits as well as the Katherine Hahn look. I just think it's a little bit blah. Black sort of tuxedo suit style. It's nothing crazy, nothing over the top. There's some sort of bra moment that exposes sort of clavicle area and at the same time creates a turtleneck moment. In that regard, it's like, okay. But at the same time, I've seen a lot more interesting things, I think, from Matthew Williams. Would I like to see them on the red carpet? No, but at the same time, I don't think there's much for Matthew Williams that I'm really, like, excited to see on a red carpet. So in that regard, like, maybe there's no winning for Laura Dern in this case, but I do think that Matthew Williams should be making a little bit more of a wave on the red carpets, I don't think the brand is super duper in the front of everybody's minds yet. And that's a problem for Givenchy, is it is a brand that is never really at the forefront of your mind when it comes to luxury brands. I think it gets trampled by the likes of Louis Vuitton, Dior, Chanel, Prada, Gucci, you know, Alexander McQueen. Th there are a lot more brands that people think of first. And I think the issue is Matthew Williams needs to make it a little bit more exciting and a little less ugly in order for us to think about it in that way. The only thing that seems really of interest is these shoes, which have some sort of like bike or chain on them or, oh, they're like little chain rings. This is not looking like great product that is highly desired in my opinion. And again, that's a problem for Givenchy. So Matthew Williams, I'm not buying, I'm not taking out my credit card for it yet. Red carpet wise, pick it up. Cause it's 
It's on the floor. Next up is Leslie Odom Jr. And he is also wearing Valentino Haute Couture. Listen, that was a big hit for the men on this red carpet. So you have this sort of light pinkish jacket and a sort of, it's like a brick, which I think in a weird way plays off of Pier Paolo's use of color. Like he isn't always sort of matchy matchy. And so in that regard, like here, I can deal with it because I do think the colors play off of each other well. There's a white shirt underneath the blazer and then a sort of key lime green turtleneck. And the shoes, I kind of would have liked a more exciting shoe in this regard. I don't know if this look gives exactly what we want it to give. I do think that it's very Valentino, but I think to the everyday person, they wouldn't get it. And like for me, I'm also kind of scratching my head trying to understand in this context, what it's supposed to be. Cause when I reviewed the, the Valentine Haute Couture collection, I didn't really do men's cause I just, it was too much for me. And so when I'm looking at it now and getting more of a close look, I want a little bit more. I want to understand it a bit cause it just feels a little bit discombobulated and it's not a bad discombobulation, but it's not a good discombobulation either. Next up is Lily Collins and she is wearing Saint Laurent. She is a Saint Laurent woman. I just think that there could have been a much more exciting dress than this. Like, listen, I do think that the one shoulder sort of style and the cutout at the side is fine. I think it makes sense. I understand it. She's a gorgeous woman. So of course she's gonna like carry it. But at the same time, I think it's just blah. You know what I mean? Like it's just, meh, it's just. And also the colors on it, I don't think are really that exciting. I don't think they're really that pretty. I do think they're a little bit odd. I think the motif is just very loud, but at the same time, not loud enough. So like it's so in your face, but at the same time, I don't want to listen. Sometimes when things are loud, I kind of want to like hear this. I, I, I just, I want to put my AirPods in. I don't want, I want to keep walking. I'm okay. Thank you so much. I'm not buying what you're selling. Uh, it's, it's not, it's not working in that regard. Just not really an attractive dress. In cut, it's okay, but in the motif, it's scary to say the very least. And it's even scarier for the fact that it not only probably went down a runway, but also that her stylist picked it out and said, ooh, this looks good. So honestly, I think Lily Collins has been having some like decent moments, like pretty strong, solid experiences. This is not one of those. Next up is Margot Robbie at Chanel. And I'm gonna say this, and I really don't like to say this ever. She needs to fire her stylist. It's not working. It's not exciting. Like you look at Andre Day and you say, oh, wow. Like Chanel by Virginie Viard can look really, really nice. And then you look at Margot Robbie and you're like, oh, why have we chosen this moment like what was the reason for choosing this dress that looks like you bought it at forever 21 and then you put your new chanel belt over it it does not look good it is not a well-designed dress i think the off the shoulder slash strap moment is strange i think the motif is ugly to say the least underwhelming to say the absolute best i think the ruffles the tiers of ruffles are hideous and again it's giving zara it's not giving Chanel ready to wear that probably costs 2,500 for your dress. The slit is horrendous. I don't understand why it was necessary. And I think the cut of that dress does not warrant a slit like that. It is not a sexy dress. I'm not saying a slit always has to have sex involved in it, but like this especially has nothing to do with sex. This has, this has everything to do with puritanical bullshit. And this is upsetting me. At this point, that spring 2021 collection had like enough good looks to go on both hands. So the fact that this was chosen, it's an issue. Again, it is giving you H&M dress with your mom's Chanel belt placed over it. Next up is Maya Rudolph and she is wearing Valentino. Now this is from the Ready to Wear collection. Maya is a very dedicated Valentino wearer. She really, she wears a lot of it. And I think usually for the most part, it actually looks pretty good on her. I don't think this is like a bad dress. I do think this is more of like a tunic dress. The shape isn't miraculous, but at the same time on the runway, I don't think it's miraculous. And I think in a weird way, Valentino was kind of like flowy like that. Like it wants to be a little bit caftani. It wants to be a little bit sort of loosey goosey. And so in that regard, if that's what it was going for, like, yes, it's achieved that, but I don't think it's really great. I don't think it's really wonderful. I don't think it's really show stopping. I do think there are better looks that uh, my Rudolph could have went for. And I've seen her in better Valentino moments. So in this regard, I do expect more from that. Listen, let's rehab this idea. Where was the Valentino haute couture for Maya Rudolph? Next up is Nicola Coughlin and she is wearing Molly Goddard and like, bless this woman's heart. 
I'm obsessed with her. I think she's great. I think she takes risks. I think she's very exciting. I love this. Now, this is a Molly Goddard yellow sort of dress. It's big, it's poofy. It's from the spring 2021 collection. It's very light, it's very airy. I think that it captures a sort of Britishness, which I think Nicola Coughlin sort of probably plays into very, very well. She's been doing things revolving around Bridgerton and also the British Fashion Council. So I think that this collaboration makes a lot of sense in my mind. Also, I just think it's a nice dress. I like the ruching, I like the smocking. I like that it creates godets that sort of create this textured sort of shape as well. I also like this little black jacket. I know that it's not by Molly Goddard. I don't know the name of the brand off the top of my head and we'll put it here in the text. I think that it is almost Molly Goddard-esque. It adds a solid sort of moment. And the thing is, I think very rarely are stylists able to like actually style things nowadays. And I think that this is a very good job of that. I think that this little black cardigan actually accentuates the dress well. I think that it adds a little bit more like of a conservative sort of vibe to it without sort of up the dress and what the dress is trying to give. So it's loud and it's over the top, but at the same time, it's sort of a little bit restrained, a little bit pulled back. And I like that dichotomy, especially with a big sort of Molly Goddard dress like this. So in this regard, Nicola Coughlin doing a great job, keep it going, very proud. Next up is Nicole Kidman and she's wearing a black halter dress by Louis Vuitton. I like this. I'm I'm not mad about this. And I actually think that this is a very interesting sort of nod back to Nicolas Jesquier's work. Now there was a collection, I'm gonna go with like it was fall 2015, fall 2016, that was very heavily inspired by technology. And there were these really great bags that had this sort of chain motif that had little elements of the Louis Vuitton monogram inside of the motif. And like, I still really want one of those bags. They're really beautiful, like the pink ones, chef's kiss. So I think in this regard, this is probably a slight and subtle reference back to that motif and that style that is very Jesquier at Vuitton. I think that the dress fits her really, really lovely. I think that it's actually really, really simple. And I like the fact that the chain motif actually creates shape in the dress. And that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for Nicolas Jesquier to do over the top, ridiculous, crazy cutouts and styles and gathers and pulls. And like, I don't want that. I want nice red carpet looks. This is a nice red carpet look. This is the energy that we have. And this is the energy that we should keep on going with Vuitton. If you're listening, if you're watching, this is it. Stay here, do this, and keep getting better at it. Reference Nicolas Jesquier's great work, please. Because there is some great work in there. And when we, when we get it, we got it, we're good. So this nice dress, very enjoyable, subtle reference, Back to the Jeskier collections of ready to wear. That's all we're asking for. Please don't give us the bells and whistles. We've seen the bells and whistles. They're not enjoyable. This is very, very enjoyable. Nicole Kidman, you look stunned. Next up is Regina King and she's wearing Louis Vuitton. And actually, I also really like this. I do think that Regina King and Nicolas Jeskier's collaborations of Louis Vuitton are actually really nice. Not always nice, but partially nice. And I like this custom look. So the thing that I really enjoy about it is the sort of silver sequins that create a sort of bodice shape and allow the black rest of the dress behind it to sort of create the outline and the shape. And I think that's a very smart way to go about making a dress like this. It's also not boring. I do think that this sort of interesting cutout, I'm not really mad about it. Normally I don't think I gravitate towards things like that. I do think that they sort of throw off a look. Whereas here I think it actually sort of works. I think it gives it just that little twang of Nicolas Jesquier sort of oddness that I'm used to, but it's not too much. It's not overindulging in that ridiculousness that makes it undesirable. I think in reality, you could actually see this dress and see this dress made very much more sort of simply, conservatively, and then it being sold to customers. Like this I could genuinely see being in a store or I could see this being like a finale look on a runway. And so in that regard, I think it works. I do know that Nicolas Jesquier at Louis Vuitton really likes silver. He does like metallic sort of styles. He's very heavily into technology um, and sort of those sorts of styles. And so in that way, I think this all works quite well together. I think it's exciting. I think it's good. I think I could see it being sold in a store. And I think that's what Louis Vuitton red carpet looks need to be. I don't think they need to be avant-garde, over the top, crazy. I think they need to look like they will sell and make money and look good. Next up is Rosamund Pike, and she is also wearing Molly Goddard. I love it. It's great. 
It's wonderful. Again, I like the fact that you have these sort of godets created of the smocking. Now, smocking is a technique that Molly Goddard really, really enjoys. And it's where essentially you utilize like elasticy fabrics to create the sort of tension in a dress that allows like the puff and the tool here in this case to sort of create a texture that's very interesting. I also love the fact that you're getting the smocking to sort of create layers of the tool, but not like layers, layers, but it's almost like the top sort of part of the dress is shrunken or like being shrunken. And so in that regard, it adds like a whole different sort of style of texture to the tool that you wouldn't normally see. So in that regard, I also think it's really exciting. I like that there's not too much else going on. I think the dress is enough. I think it's big, I think it's bold, I think it's out there, I think it's wonderful. And again, I like that people are taking risks here. I like that we're working with small designers like Molly Goddard. She just had an amazing fucking collection. You'll see the review very soon. I thought it was wonderful. And I think it's a brand that definitely is trying to push its itself past this tool sort of style. I feel like Molly Goddard at the same time is saying like, listen, you might think we're one trick ponies, but in reality, what we do, we do very, very well, but we also can do other stuff. And I think this is them doing it very, very well. So I really enjoy this. I really love this. Next up is Sarah Paulson, and she is wearing Prada. So I actually just saw this collection in stores. Or this is a custom take on the first Raph Simmons and Mutra Prada collaboration collection. Off the shoulder sort of strapless moment. It's a little bit too asymmetrical for me, but like that's sort of Prada-y. The embellishments are on there, but I don't really think they're that exciting. That belt, I will say, it looks a little bit cheap and chintzy. It looks almost like a car seat belt, but at the same time, it's quite heavy. It's like made out of this nice sort of metal and it says Prada on it and it sort of falls down. These big sort of 1950s skirts are very Mutra Prada. It is sort of very early on a reference that she really enjoyed sort of utilizing that. The first collection that she really did it in was I think her first collection, which was autumn winter, either 1989 or 1988. And in that regard, it is very central to sort of the Prada brand. And Nutra Prada likes to reference herself. So in that regard, it's very much so a part of the brand and its history. The shape of it, it's fine. I think the embellishments are lacking and I think the off the shoulder can work, but I think I'm a little bit off put because there's just a lot going on and I know that that's Prada. I know that I've said before, like it's Prada, that's what it's meant to do. But like in this regard, I think it's too much. I will say the Prada collections have been utilizing a lot of sort of sleeves and gloves, which I think are really, really cool and really, really interesting. And I like the fact that Sarah Paulson, I assume broke her arm or hurt her arm. And there's a cast here and it has the Prada triangle on it. And I think that that is amazing. That is working with what you have, utilizing what you got to make it happen. And I think that's wonderful. I think that's funny. I think that's great. I think it's humorous. I think that's important. And I really like the fact that they're working with what they got and they're making it work well. And overall, it's not the best look I've ever seen, but I do think that it channels Prada. It's referential of the brand's history and it's working with what you got. And so in that regard, like, all right. Next up is Shira Haas and she is wearing Chanel and this is just sort of a very simple Chanel dress. I think it's a little bit too simple. I do think that it's sort of like a black cocktail dress with some sort of, you know, chiffon overlay that creates a sort of long gown style. It's boring. It's not really that exciting. And I like Shira Haas. I think that she actually does sort of pull out nice looks for Chanel. I just think there are more exciting looks, especially from that spring 2021 Haute Couture collection. Like, Andre Day wore it, so why isn't everybody else wearing haute couture? I'm not understanding. And even if this is haute couture, it's too simple haute couture for me. I wouldn't know. So in that regard, Shira Haas, step it up. I know you can do better than this. Next up is Tiffany Haddish, and she is wearing Alberta Ferretti. And honestly, I like that she took a risk. I'm really proud of her. I think that she's really stepping it up and doing the work to sort of make it much more exciting. I don't know if I love the dress. I do like the fact that it's in this sort of metallic it looks like chainmail but it's not it's not a chainmail it's just a lot of different sort of metallic bits put into stripes and so it's creating this very interesting motif i do think that i want something a little bit better i like the fact that she's working with alberto ferretti i think it's a great brand i think it's really really wonderful i think it makes clothing that is actually wearable. And so in this regard, I like that as a step out for Alberta Ferretti from just sort of like, you know, the normal everyday wear kind of stuff. But I do think that it needs to be channeled better. I will say I'm not obsessed with it, but I am obsessed with the fact that Tiffany Haddish is taking risks. And so in that regard, like I'm very proud, very happy. Can't wait to see what comes next because I think that she's definitely working to make sure that she's serving a moment and that's what we want and that's what we expect. And so, I appreciate that. It just has to be better next time. Our finale look is 
none other than Viola Davis. And she is wearing Lavi by CK. I love it. 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 Now, Claude Camille actually makes beautiful sort of structural ball gowns. And like this mermaid cut is one of their signatures. It's stunning. They utilize a lot of takes on traditional African wax prints. I love it. It's colorful. I think Viola Davis looks really, really stunning. I think it fits her wonderfully. I think not only is the motif very loud, very abrupt, very in your face, which in the history of these prints, like that's what they've always been. And so in that regard, I love it. I've come to really appreciate them. I think it comes from a lot of handiwork. I don't think people really understand how much work goes into wax prints. It takes so much time, it takes so much labor, it takes so much effort, it takes so much expertise to make just one wax print. And in that regard here, it looks beautiful, it looks stunning, it looks wonderful. I also think that the cut is fantastic. I like the little slightly puffed sleeves. I like the cut of the torso and then this dramatic fanning out of this mermaid skirt. It's beautiful. It's stunning. It adds this grandeur, this elegance, this over the top opulence that I want to see from brands. And so in that regard, I'm very happy with this. I think she looks stunning. She looks so, so happy. She looks wonderful. Hats off to not only Viola Davis, but also Claude Camille because killing it. They are killing it. The girls are killing it. So that is the end of our Golden Globes 2021 review. So let's just do a best and a worst. Now, my best is going to go to... Hmm. It's gotta be Cynthia Erivo. That Valentino look was stunning. It was beautiful. It was really, really lovely. It's so exciting. It makes you think. It's a beautiful cut. It's hot. Least favorite goes to Margot Robbie because it's just time after time, it's shitty ass look from Chanel after shitty ass look from Chanel. I don't know what's happening. Because now you have Andre Day showing you that you can look great in Chanel. It's a you problem, Margot Robbie and Margot Robbie stylist. It's you, it's on you, you gotta fix this. So we need to fix it. Uh, and listen, nobody's paying me, so I'm not jumping up to fix anything. So with that, Please let me know what some of your guys' favorite looks from the uh, red carpet were and what some of your least favorite looks from the red carpet were. I'd love to hear that in the comments down below. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYL.